Health and Only Mode. Good morning, and welcome to the fifth in our 2012 series of Green Prisons, uh, looking at uh, the seven steps of sustainability in corrections. Uh, today's webinar is on water and water, effective water management. We have a uh, very diverse program with three very knowledgeable individuals from around the country, uh, very diverse in their approach to water management, um, and um, we're confident that, that you'll get uh, some, some good information today. Um, your, um, your presenters. Uh, our first, Ed Howell of Icon Systems, uh, Peg Ritchie, who is a correctional consultant uh, who will be addressing uh, waterless urinals, and Peg is the former Deputy Director of Corrections in California, among other places. And finally, uh, Bob Bulware, who is a uh, civil engineer operating out of Indianapolis, Indiana, and Bob will talk about rainwater management. Um, the, uh, the presentations that you'll get this morning may seem a little more pro proprietary than those we've done in the past, um, but um, that's primarily driven by the, the nature of the, the technologies that we're going to be looking at. They are very different approaches to, to, uh, to effective water management. Some may work better in your system than others, so we wanted to try and give you as as broad a look at, at what's out there and what's available as we could. So um, with that, uh, we're going to again remind you that um, as we get started, there is a raise your hand and question box that's on your dashboard. Uh, we typically will ask you to, you can certainly go ahead and pose your questions, but we're going to hold off responding to them uh, until uh, after the third presentation to ensure that we get everything, that all three presenters have an equal amount of time and can get their material accomplished in the 45 to 50 minutes we have allocated for the webinar itself. Uh, at that point, we'll make an effort to um, uh, take those questions. Can, we, we may end up consolidating them. Um, depending on the nature of the question and, and how many people have a particular interest. Uh, what I would ask you to do, uh, I'm kind of by myself this morning in terms of responding to those, so I'm going to ask you to, whether you raise your hand or not, to certainly type in your question uh, so that I can try and catch that as, as the speaker goes along and, and ideally uh, be able to pick those up and get back to them. Uh, we anticipate that the webinar itself will last about 45 to 50 minutes and then plus whatever uh, time we have left over uh, for, for questions and depending on how many questions we have. Um, as, as always, the webinar will be archived on greenprisons.org where you can also access all the previous webinars, both the uh, ones we did prior to uh, 2012, as well as this, now the fifth webinar in the 2012 series. Just uh, those should be up uh, on the website not later than Sunday night. So um, certainly if you're interested uh, or want to play this again or want to share it with, uh, with someone else on your staff who didn't, wasn't available to sit in, the uh, not only the slides but also the, the um, oral narrative is available for you there. With that in mind, we're going to go ahead and get started. And at this point, I'm going to turn the, uh, the microphone over to Ed Howell with Icon Systems. Good morning, Ed. Good morning, everyone. Um, the current slide that you're witnessing says the time for conservation is now. And according to Webster's Dictionary, we define conservation as a careful <coughs> preservation and protection of something, especially planned management of a natural resource to prevent exploitation, destruction, or neglect. And then once we look at that and say that that, that is what conservation is, why is conservation of water important? Uh, there was a study done in 2000 by the USGS, uh, uh, some lady by the name of Susan S. Hut Hudson, uh, looked in and said that total freshwater withdrawal for public supply 
were 43.3 billion gallons per day in the U.S., which is quite an incredible figure when you stop to think about it. Uh, there are 10 states with the largest public supply withdrawals, and they start out from California to go through all the way down to Arizona. Um, the ranking in there uh, is important. Uh, companies are working with these 10 top, top uh, states to try and uh, uh, improve water conservation with them so that uh, they're not wasting water. Next. Uh, the top 10 problems facing humanity for the next 50 years. This list consists of 10, 10 objectives, and this was developed by a gentleman who uh, was a Nobel laureate by the name of Richard Smalley with the Smalley Institute. And you see on that list, uh, energy and water are number one and two on the list. And according to Richard Smalley in 2003, uh, if abundant, affordable energy, clean energy, and water were readily available to everybody, all of the other eight problems become much easier to solve. Consequently, energy and water are at the top of the list. So basically, he's identifying water and energy as the top two, and then the other, other eight would fall into place if you could develop uh, solutions for conserving both energy and water. Next. The problem, prisons and jails have a common security, expense, and maintenance issue. They're plumbing fixtures. Now, uh, the most common issues facing correctional plumbing fixtures are excessive toilet use and waste of water by inmates. Uh, it's not, most people don't realize that since they don't have waste baskets and so forth in the, in the uh, cells, the prisoners use the toilets to flush literally everything down. And uh, a prisoner can use anywhere between 120 to 149 gallons of water per day per inmate, which is quite remarkable. Rapid wear and tear increasing maintenance costs. So the more that they use those fixtures, the more they have a tendency to wear them down and the replacement costs increase. Uh, flushing contraband leading to reduced control and security speaks for itself. Uh, it takes away the control away from the the uh, facility and gives it to the inmates, and we're trying to reverse that. Uh, the last one, fixture abuse resulting in flooded cells and clogged pipes. Uh, if a prisoner is allowed unlimited access to flushes and so forth, sometimes they're unruly, and they make it a point to try and, and be as ornery as they can, and will uh, deliberately try to flood their cells. So we also attempt to uh, address that issue, too. Next. The solution, Icon Plumbing Systems. Um, the first one up here is that we reduce, reduce and stabilize utility operating expenditures and uh, reducing water usage by up to 70 percent. Uh, that's basically the water that we do come in contact with. Needless to say, we don't do things like irrigation, uh, laundry, and kitchen, but when it comes to the, the water that the prisoners or the staff see, we can reduce that up by up to 70 percent. Reducing the volume of uh, water reduces the amount of sewage going out, so there's savings involved there. Also reduced maintenance costs uh, such as uh, parts costs, lift stations, muffin monsters, and so forth. Those all uh, fall into place once you cure the, the volume of water that you got going through. Uh, vandal resistance systems, we have uh, uh, the ability now to remove the inmate ability to abuse the plumbing system. Uh, the less that you expose to them, the less they can abuse. Uh, reduce vandalism and abuse equals reduced cost. That kind of goes uh, uh, unsaid, I guess. You, it, it's, they go hand in hand. And the last thing on here, enhanced security, uh, equals reduced cost and increased safety. If you can enhance the security, Again, you're giving control of many different aspects of water and also the uh, uh, different security things back to the, the uh, uh, staff itself. It says on here that it's a win-win con. You conserve water and cost, but it's actually a triple win. You conserve water, conserve cost, and you inc increase security. Next. So who are we? Uh, my company's been around uh, since 1994. 
Uh, it says on here, field installation of proprietary and reliable plumbing controls. Um, we actually, ICON is a manufacturer. We don't actually do the installations except when it comes to uh, samples, but we have uh, certified installers that can do that, that kind of work for, for projects. Um, manufacture state-of-the-art control systems, patented technology to reduce, reduce water up to 70%, and we've talked about that on a previous slide. Uh, we've got approximately 30 patents and patent pending for water conservation plumbing products uh, in place at this time. Uh, the flush valves that, that we have are ASSE certified and listed. Um, turnkey services that ICON provides. Installation, again, that's uh, through one of our certified installers. Surveys, which we can provide, and we also offer in-house training or if if absolutely necessary, we can actually go out and perform that in the field. Product overview, the products that we offer are flush valves, lavatory valves, shower valves, urinal valves, uh, and for new and retrofit installations. We, one of our biggest fortes is getting in and actually retrofitting a facility that, that might have older technology and we bring it up to current levels. Uh, Non-communicating and communicating systems, what that means is we, we have controls that this is all the technology that's out there now. It's either you can install individual controls that stand alone by themselves or you can tie them in a uh, communicating system with a central computer that's located in a command center and uh, is really maintained and monitored by the, uh, the uh, security staff. Uh, computer system network operation for main control of pods and units by touchscreen technology goes along with that communicating system. Uh, the systems that are out there now are either 24 volt or battery operated. The 24 volt is the most prevalent. Uh, since it's low voltage, it's fairly easy to install and, and maintain. Um, last thing on there is new stainless steel series of fixtures that is coming soon. Next. Uh, this is just a comparison of some of the technology that's out there. There's a, a, a pneumatic retrofit block assembly, uh, and those are uh, components for a lot of times you'll see those on lavatories or showers, and it shows what, what the transition can be from uh, a mechanical type system to basically a, a, a solenoid and a solid block system. Um, very few moving parts, which reduces maintenance and, and should re, uh, reduce the repair costs as well. Next. Touch sensors versus push buttons. Uh, uh, those, some of the, the push buttons that are out there, I've, I've actually seen it where they've uh, been able to remove a long rod that goes in. It's not with this particular system that you see here, but some of the old manual systems had uh, push rods in there that could actually be removed and used as shivs and so forth. So the newer technologies that are out there are either this pneumatic that you see on the left or you see it, uh, the, the, it's a what they call a strain gauge principle. It's an electronic sensor. There are no moving parts on it. Next. Uh, here you see the flush valves. Uh, some of the other flush valves, a lot of the one on the left you'll see is uh, what you see in a lot of facilities, ex exposed flush valves and whatnot. Um, the one on the right is our, our, what we call our momentum flush valve, has a positive seal on it. Um, has some advantages over, over the other, other uh, brands that are out there, but that's, that's a sales call, not a green call. So, Next. These are some of the pictures that were taken of uh, some installations and uh, the top right uh, or the top center shows a bank of, of tempered showers that use uh, a 5775 series shower valve. That's a uh, uh, valve that we have that's maximum flow. The next one you see is a to the right of that is a, a toilet slash urinal with exposed valve. It was retrofitted and then they put a custom enclosure over it to hide the, uh, the workings on it so the prisoners didn't have access. Right below that is a lavatory, stainless steel lavatory that's coming soon. We'll be uh, putting those out. Below that is a pneumatic retrofit. Went from a pneumatic to actually a 24-volt solenoid system. To the left of that is a, uh, a flush valve retrofit. And then above that is a stainless steel combi, which again will be coming soon. Next. Okay. 
We have uh, on the left, you see a flush valve system uh, for either a china or a stainless steel toilet that's exposed. They, they can put all the inner workings in there and then enclose it with a stainless steel enclosure. And then on the right, you see a standard pipe chase where uh, uh, you have a toilet retrofit and it looks like there was a lavatory retrofit along with that. It goes, it goes into a 24 volt controller. Next. The touchscreen technology that's out there now um, it's, is actually customized to each facility, uses a map of the facility and not just a spreadsheet. Uh, touchscreen controls allow the correctional officers to lock down water in a single cell or an entire pod in seconds for security purposes. Real-time monitoring of water consumption in the command center, they can actually see when, when a, a fixture is being operated. Uh, collection of water consumption data allows facilities to evaluate and determine the appropriate controller setting for maximum water conservation. So this is this all ties back in with the water conservation. Next, um, this was actually a case study that was done through uh, the Federal Energy Management Program or FEMP, um, and the slide pretty much speaks for itself. It's uh, it was 98 millions of gallons of water uh, annually uh, that they figure for a correctional facility with 900 cells or 1,800 inmates. And the FDOC uh, retrofitted approximately 20 institutions to date, uh, and they're currently saving over 200 million gallons annually. And since they've uh, initiated this program in 2003, they've uh, saved over 1 billion gallons. These are some of the states that we're in. There's besides the states that you see here. There's also 19 additional states plus uh, uh, Canada is involved in that. So as you can see, there's a lot of a lot of states out there that are interested in conserving water. Uh, some of them it's more critical than others, depending upon drought and whatnot. So it's very very important that if you're facing that kind of situation, even if you're not facing that kind of situation, you need to prepare for the future and start conserving the water now. And the final slide that we have up here is basically contact information. Uh, if you require more information about our products and so forth, you can contact our national sales manager, a fellow by the name of Ray Elliott, and it's got his contact information there. Um, you can also send us an email uh, to, if you go on our website at www.iconsystems.com, there is a spot that you can submit uh, questions and so forth to us by email. And that uh, concludes the portion of my uh, my presentation. I thank you all for, for your participation. Thanks, Ed. We appreciate it. Um, very informative. And, uh, uh, again, I don't have any questions that have popped up, but if something occurs to you as you listen to one of the other presenters, be sure and, and type it in the box, and we'll get to that uh, before the end of the webinar. I would also tell you that... Uh, uh, out of our three presenters, um, um, Ed and, uh, well, I don't think, Ed, you'll be there, but certainly ICON will be represented next week at Southern States Correctional Associations Conference in Lexington, Kentucky, as well as uh, a booth at ACA, and they will also be doing a presentation at the uh, Green Prison Symposium in, in uh, Indianapolis this fall. So if you'd like more information, or like to talk to one of their representatives personally, you can do that at one of those three upcoming events. All righty, we're going to move on now to uh, Peg Ritchie. Uh, and as I indicated in the opener, Peg is, is uh, a retired deputy director of, of corrections in California um, and has a, a broad career in, in, uh, in corrections and correctional management. She's going to talk to us about waterless urinals. So, Peg, I'm going to turn it over to you at this point. Thanks, Tommy. G good morning, everybody. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to be with you this morning. There was a, a recent uh, case study in a publication called Greening Corrections Technology Guidebook. And I don't know, Joe Russo could be online with us this morning. He's from the uh, Law Enforcement Center in Rocky Mountain, who are co-publishers of this document. And basically, they were saying, you know, the case the case for uh, waterless urinals in prisons, you know, um, we're not sure yet. So I kind of, 
you know, um, looked at other articles and documents and tried to come up with what are some of the basic information issues and, and what works for waterless urinals in prisons or administration buildings or jails. Um, so anyway, we're going to take a look at that case study this morning, some of the successes and failures around it, what lessons have been learned, and then what are some applications that can be used in prisons in different types of envir environments, and then what kind of products are out there on the market, including a new uh, product that's going to be piloted in Arizona uh, from liquidbreaker.com. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And so next slide. So what were some of the outcomes in, in the case study? For example, why use waterless urinals? Well, they earn LED credits. Water savings can be from 15,000 to 45,000 gallons per urinal in a year. Savings can run up to about 3,000 a year. And proper installation and retrofitting are critical, proper preparation of lines in order for waterless urinals to succeed. And some facilities are so old that the pipelines, for example, wouldn't even allow for this technology without some major um, changes in, in the facility. Next slide. And also, uh, Tommy just talked about American Correctional Association having their meeting next week in Denver and the technology uh, committee on green energy that Tommy hosts will be a part of that. ACA, through these efforts, has established an accreditation standard for both jails and prisons around energy utilization. So again, another plus for using water savings such as waterless urinals. Uh, of course, drought prone areas, uh, Ed talked about that too, water conservation. And in fact, in Arizona, the state requires use of waterless urinals in state buildings and other facilities. Next slide. Um, other issues, uh, here's a quote from that document. Waterless urinals, when properly selected, installed, and maintained, can reduce costs, reduce environmental burden, and sewage and maintenance expenses. Next slide. So what's out on the market today? There's replacement or permanent traps. Uh, there's liquid sealant that floats on the top of the urine to form a barrier to keep sewage and sewer vapor from escaping. Um, this document indicated that Sweden has a trapless kind of air flush using a small exhaust fan to extract odors. Australia has a design. It turns off water and places it with a small block of microbes each week. Next. Again, some uh, benefits for waterless urinals, savings of one to three gallons of water per use. Low flush or dual flush can save close to an equal amount of water per use. Comparative savings can be up to $3,000 per year if maintenance issues can be resolved from some of the past problems people have had. Next. And in that particular study, uh, they talked about initial costs running from $300 to $1,000 depending on the fixtures and installation. Annual costs can vary depending on longevity of replacement of the cartridge traps, the sealant cleaning products, you know, sabotage by inmates, other kinds of issues. So next slide, how do you prevent some of the problems that people have had in the past? Oops, maybe I hit my slides and I'm um, sorry. I moved my slides. Okay, new construction savings, these are some other pluses. In new construction, if you start out by um, the facility being uh, designed for the use of waterless urinals, you can eliminate water supply lines, flush valves, sensors and drainage fixture, uh, fixtures, uh, hookup charges that they would create, uh, some of the limitations. States may still require water supply piping in case of future replacement with flush urinals. Um, installation savings and rebates are sometimes available by cities and states. What about cost recovery? Uh, this document estimated six months to three years, depending on the cost of the cartridges themselves and, and the supplies. So your savings could run from $138 to $838 each year per urinal. So again, why use waterless urinals? Um, reduce water and sewage costs eliminating infrastructure costs for fresh water or collection treatment sewage issues, no freeze protection needed, electricity costs. If 
if it's a new facility, you don't deal with some of the, the installation issues, um, things such as clogged sewer pipes, vandalism, septic load, um, electronics, transformers, etc. And waterless urinals are environmentally friendly. Next. So what are some of the usual complaints when this study was done? You know, frequent maintenance because of the changing of cartridges, costs of the cartridges themselves constantly being changed and sometimes even weekly, odor, backups, um, and also this was noted in this particular document that EPA um, WaterSense website indicates that they had some concern due to a long-term cost effectiveness as a result of increased maintenance requirements and life expectancy of the liquid seal or the cartridge. So, you know, there's some issues out there that people haven't addressed. However, um, there's a new product on the market, and I'm consulting with this company, liquidbreaker.com. You can go to their green cartridge tab, and they have solved some of the past issues that people have had with waterless urinals um, and if, if installed properly. Next slide. Again, some of the prevention issues. Um, if you want it to be successful, if it's retrofits, the drain slope and the, and the lines of the drain have to be cleaned prior to installation. If people don't do that, they've had some complications. Uh, proper drain pipe materials, maintenance, keeping proper logs. Uh, again, new installations obviously are easier than retrofits. Next. So one of the states that has been very successful with waterless urinals has been Arizona. Uh, again, not without some complications. Uh, the Globe facility in particular um, has had success. And Frank Zavala, uh, Dwayne Bussey might be online. Uh, they are two practitioners. Uh, plant managers from Arizona that have worked with waterless urinals. They've also agreed to pilot the liquid breaker um, cartridge itself and evaluate it and provide feedback to the company. So currently they've got about 70 urinals and mostly in minimum and medium prisons and in some of their administration buildings. Um, new facilities include waterless urinals, inmates do the maintenance, Arizona is estimating a savings of $277 per year per urinal at this time, or about $20,000 a year. Next slide. And so I just talked about the Douglas facility where Frank Zavala is um, the plant manager heading up a pilot for this new product. You can get a hold of me at this number and my email address and uh, inquire about looking at this particular product, trying it out. We're going to have a conference call with Ohio this morning uh, to see what their interest is in piloting uh, this new product as well. So information, liquidbreaker.com, go to the green cartridge, and we're happy to help in any way that we can um, in order to work with sustainability issues, of which one critical area, too, in sustainability, the principles, includes um, training inmates whether it's installation or maintenance. And uh, Arizona has been working with inmates on that issue. OK, so there's Frank's number in Douglas. There's Dwayne's in Globe. And um, we're happy to help you in any way to answer questions related to this and provide uh, samples for you to try out. So thanks so much, and look forward to hearing from you. Thanks again. Okay, thank you for a very informative presentation. Um, before we move on to, to Bob, I would mention that the NIJ publication that Peg cites uh, is what we consider the, the seminal piece of literature on the, um, uh, on the issue of sustainability and corrections. Uh, one of the senior advisors to uh, Green Prisons, Paul Sheldon, along with another colleague, um, Gene Atherton, a retired warden out of um, uh, Colorado were the principal authors of that study. Uh, and in addition to the NIJ uh, website, you can also download the, uh, the entire publication um, from um, uh, greenprisons.org. Or if you're going to be at ACA or Southern States, 
uh, you can pick up a, an electronic copy of the, um, uh, of the publication. It runs about 60 pages. It's a very readable document. Uh, at the uh, Portion Pack uh, exhibit booths in, in either Lexington or Denver. Uh, finally, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, Tommy, and I might add that, again, any of these documents that, that I mentioned, that Tommy's mentioning, they're also available on NICIC.gov, National Institute of Corrections uh, Information Center, NICIC.gov, and there's also all kinds of green technology information on NIC's website. Uh, from blogs to documents to other kind of resources that can help you if you're looking at what's going on out there nationally. Thank you. Okay, which you can also link to from greenprisons.org. So, moving on, uh, Bob Bullware with Design Air um, Engineers is going to talk a little bit about rainwater management and the effective use of, of rainwater as a resource. Bob, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning. Uh... As Tommy said, my name is Paul Bulware. I'm a consulting engineer out of Indianapolis, Indiana, and uh, also sit on the uh, IAPMO Green Technology Committee where we were instrumental in getting rainwater catchment and gray water uh, included in the uh, green plumbing supplement and also the uniform plumbing code. I'm also the national president of the American Rainwater Catchment Association, so in, in summary, I'm very enthusiastic about rainwater and I'm happy to be speaking before you today on the topic. Uh, next week. There's, uh, as we mentioned, there's four reasons uh, for uh, not uh, for including rainwater and gray water. If you don't have enough water, you have poor water quality, your combined sewer overflows uh, it might be an issue. And that's more an issue if you're uh, on a utility and, and uh, uh, more of a utility scale issue than, say, on a plant scale. And also you might be considering uh, rainwater harvesting for, to buffer your stormwater runoff to prevent uh, flooding on your site. Uh, so again, talking about uh, when we not, don't have enough water or poor quality water. Uh, next, please. Uh, as you, uh, next slide, please. Okay. As you look across the country uh, right now, uh, obviously there's a water shortage. The way this is color-coded is uh, down at the bottom left it says the percentile of water drawn down versus being replenished. So if you're looking at it right now, uh, things are looking pretty dire. I know it is uh, in my home state here in Indiana. Uh, next please. Looking forward, uh, Still, it looks like the bottom half to two-thirds of the country is going to be looking uh, toward water shortages with the uh, emphasis being on finding alternative uh, water sources, of which rainwater and gray water are certainly something to be considered. Next, please. About 70 percent of uh, water is for indoor use, 30 percent uh, for outdoor, for irrigation, uh, and this sort of thing. Average consumption for an office and a residence is about 100 gallons per person, and as Ed said, for a prisoner that goes up to 120 to 140 uh, gallons per person per day. And as we say, when you need the water the most, that's usually when the water utility companies want to clamp down uh, the hardest, uh, because about 30 to 40 percent of all water drawdown is used to make electricity, something that often gets lost in the, uh, the water budgeting process. Next, please. If you're considering doing a rainwater and gray water system, it's best to kind of make sort of a water budget, as you see here. This is for a typical home, which you can extrapolate uh, to your own prison environment. Um, what you basically try to do uh, is to, to document the relative differences between your, your potable water usages that actually justify the use of uh, utility-grade potable water versus water that can be either gray water or recycled water or uh, rainwater catchment. And as you see, uh, a fair amount, and this may be larger in the prisons, is toilets. Certainly something that you don't need potable water to, to, to execute. Next please. The fundamental design of a system uh, is pretty simple. You need a, uh, a roof system that is um, impervious to water, obviously, as, as uh, the, the fundamental purpose of a roof is, uh, but galvalume and, and clay tile work better. Sloped, uh, sloped uh, roofs look better than flat roofs just because they keep themselves clean a little bit. Off to the left, the first thing you want to do after you use your gutters is 
Um, your, your filtrate is to keep the, the organic material uh, out of your storage. And how you do that can be very simply like having a, a leaf eater situation you see on the left that goes to your underground tank. Then when your tank overflows, it then is available. To, it overflows into water in your garden or goes someplace else to your normal storm uh, collection system. Uh, the system to your right is a little uh, one notch more sophisticated in that you go through your leaf separator, you go through the pipe into your tank, and we'll talk about that little bulge uh, hanging down there in just a minute. Uh, the tank uh, can be plastic, it can be concrete, it can be corrugated metal, uh, it can be a lot of materials uh, with, with uh, in some cases, uh, some of the old redwood tanks you see in operation as rainwater catchment systems. Uh, it's important that you see uh, around your overflows and the vent there on top of the tank that they be protected from mosquitoes and, uh, and the critters kind of crawling into your tank. This one here has what's called an overflow. You see the pipe going down to the bottom of the tank and, uh, and what that is is when it begins to overflow it then sucks the muck off the bottom of the tank and then of course it, it overflows and goes into your storm drainage system. The part that's hanging down is called a, a first flush device. Uh, what that does is it wastes the first part of the rain event, which is presumed to clear the, the debris and the dirt off the, the roof collection surface. And after this predetermined volume, this tank fills up, then it is overflowed into your tank. If you can see the next slide, please. The filtration can be fairly fundamental. This is maybe your, your grandfather's uh, rainwater pretreatment where uh, you had a manual valve, and after a period of time, they just uh, flipped the valve from the, the, the system that basically kept the leaves out of the tank. Uh, after a while, he just flipped it, and then the, when he presumed that the water was clean, and then that, then it was allowed to go into your system. Uh, next slide, please. One step up, which is kind of popular with in, uh, in Australia, and it was developed out of there in New Zealand is again the roof wash system where the contaminated water comes in, it fills up, uh, and then basically after this predetermined uh, water is, used, is, is wasted essentially, then it overflows and goes into, the, um, into your system. This is appropriate for maybe a small, medium-sized system. Uh, and as you see the water drips out the bottom, there's about a 16th inch hole that uh, allows the water to drip out that has been stored and then the uh, it's, a, it's available for the next rain event, and you do periodically need to clean that out. Typically, you use this as a clean-out plug. In freezing environments, you just leave the plug out, and then it's allowed to, um, um, if you have a, a, a tank that is not protected from freezing, it just serves as a normal downspout. Uh, turn the page, please. The uh, next more sophisticated level is, is a, what's a centrifugal filter, and the way this works uh, is that the water comes in the top, it spins around, uh, and uh, what's being pointed to is a uh, 100 mesh stainless steel screen. And when the screen is dry, the water goes straight through along the leaves and the sticks and things, and then uh, continues through the pipe uh, out to the bottom right. Once that screen is, is wet, uh, capillary action then goes between that inner chamber to the outer collection chamber, uh, and then comes out to the cistern to the left. Um, and it, it's pretty interesting devices. They do a very good job uh, in, in separating uh, and, and pre-filtering, separating the debris and, and pre-filtering the water going into your system. Next slide, please. Uh, once you go through your rainwater filter shown up on the left, uh, it's, it's best to go in and have what they call a calm then let the water goes in, and rather than just sloshing it into the tank at the top, uh, you turn it up and then point it up. This allows the oxygen to be uh, put into your tank to keep the water fresh. Uh, up near the top we see this little uh, rubber ball and that's called a floating in, uh, intake. Uh, lot commonly you see the outlets uh, come about 4 inches or 12 inches out the bottom of the tank. Uh, the best quality water is right below the surface which this type of system takes advantage of. Uh, that little square that you see at the end of the flex tubing is actually your, your water pickup point. Um, over to the right, you see an overflow system that's a little, it's a skimming filter, and this is basically beneficial in areas that see a lot of tree pollen that floats on the top of the tank, and which can become quite gummy, 
uh, in your piping system. So what this does is, is overflow and then take the, the pollen out of it out of the tank, keeping your water clean in your system. Next, please. Uh, and skip this. Sometimes, uh, again, you have rainwater collection for uh, stormwater management. Uh, you know, a lot of our world is, is uh, paved. Next slide, please. Uh, and in parking lots and things like that, you, you have a lot more surface runoff than, uh, than prior. And oftentimes, the existing storm system uh, then is severely undersized after you you pave a large area or put a, a big roof uh, over an area that was formerly uh, grass that allowed the water to infiltrate. So, so what do you do? Uh, do you make just a bigger pipe? Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe a better way would be to control your site grade first. So to uh, water your adjacent vegetation uh, just by site grading, uh, grading rather, uh, and, and control your, your, your drainage that way before it gets to your storm system. Uh, next, please. Another option is to have pervious parking areas that allows the water to go into your aquifer uh, rather than into your street down to your, your, your storm collection system. Uh, another Next slide, please. Another option would be to uh, put an underground cistern where the storm water goes in. This can be either off your roof or even off your, your parking lot. And you can then store it for future use. Uh, then this, this sand is filtered out. It's pumped to your distribution system. Uh, we show here a, a landscape irrigation. This could also be for a laundry. It could be cooling tower makeup. Uh, it could be um, a bus washdown facility. It could be anything, but it, the point is it kind of allows you to have water available uh, that does not get sent down to the sewer, and therefore you get a sewer charge as well. Um, what this system is on is basically it's a plastic, uh, looks like a bunch of milk crates uh, wrapped in a roofing uh, a pond liner. Uh, when it is overflowed, it goes into the, the little structure to your right, which is a geocloth, which allows the water to infiltrate into the aquifer. And then once that's filled up, then it overflows and then goes to your sewer up there, uh, just, uh, just above it there. Next, please. The benefit of putting water into the ground rather than running it uh, uh, to the sewer is that you basically, this is a case of Tucson, Arizona, where Brad Lancaster, a good friend of mine, uh, uh, had the program where you take rainwater runoff and you basically divert it along the curb, that little green belt area that you see to the left between the sidewalk and the street where they put trees. And they made a little curb, cups, uh, curb cuts, they diverted it to water the trees. Ten years later you see uh, the picture to the right in the same neighborhood. So the punchline here is that uh, more trees lead to less cooling uh, requirement, which is less power for your air conditioning. On a utility scale, uh, less water is needed by your utility to make electricity. And then along the same lines, uh, your water company uses less electricity to make the water, uh, which, uh, which can be between 1.5 to 12 kW per thousand gallons. Um, so, and if you're that's your own utility, uh, you're, you're using your own wells, then that's money that you're not uh, spending. Uh, next, please. So a lot of people were concerned that there are other guidelines out there to go by, or, or is it just everything an engineered system? Uh, next, please. The, uh, the Green Technology Committee I serve on has been active in, in uh, actually they've got a revised one coming out to, that came out in 2012 uh, that talks a little bit more about uh, what, maintaining the water quality in a uh, water storage system. Uh, and ICC has their own standard there that, that basically provides guidelines for both rainwater and gray water uh, installation. Next, please. Various states and cities uh, before the national guidelines have come out have initiated their own water standards and gray water standards that you see before you were here. Uh, next slide. Uh, certain cities uh, have been also active, uh, Austin, tu uh, uh, Tucson, um, and the question mark, it's changing every day. Uh, uh, Chicago is moving forward. California, as we speak, is, is developing a rainwater catchment standard. And last year, Atlanta, uh, first one in the country that we're aware of, allows potable water, uh, rainwater application for potable water. Uh, 
Um, so more and more people are becoming aware of rainwater catchment as an alternative water source. Next, please. Uh, a lot of people talk about the economics of rainwater catchment system. Uh, this is uh, my hometown here in Indianapolis. If you are going down to make a tap on their main, this is what they're likely to charge you. And then probably where you're from, it's going to be very similar uh, um, uh, cost. Then you can amplify that with the size of the, the pipe that goes to wherever you want to, your, your end use. The, um, uh, so th this is your, your first cost that, that we're talking about here. Uh, typically on bigger systems you have a better uh, payback as you can see because of pipe sizes and, and uh, if you have a more localized source of water it then can impact the, the cost of the system. Payback typically can be between 8 to 12 years. Uh, Home Depot uh, had one as, as uh, nine months uh, down in Georgia that was used for their lawn care uh, system, their lawn section. Um, rainwater and graywater systems are put in uh, for uh, lead points and they basically, uh, this is a lead option that actually has a payback. When you compare it to things like being near a bus stop, uh, bike racks, green roofs, things like that, this is something that actually uh, will favorably impact your uh, your pocketbook. Um, it can also be used uh, by recycling your gray water and, and using uh, rainwater as a, an alternative water source. It can offset any uh, any water and sewer plant expan expansions. Uh, gray water sewage treatment plant uh, is uh, gray water used as a significant uh, reduction of your, your sewage outfall, which can be as much as uh, 50 to 60 percent, uh, and sometimes higher depending on uh, how aggressive you want to be in, in chasing down all your gray water options. Um, prison applications uh, likely would be uh, cooling tower makeup, laundry, uh, and bus wash. The advantage there would be soft water, which uses a lot less soap, which is, uh, uh, again, an economic savings, but also as a, uh, an environmental savings. And then irrigation of flowers, gardens, shrubs, uh, things of that nature. Ne next, please. Uh, applications that we've seen, uh, this is an a off-grid installation at a research center in Panama. They have photovoltaic uh, uh, shingles on the roof, but you see the pipe goes to an underground cistern. And that vegetation you see, that garden, is, is uh, not only an aesthetic, but it's also part of their gray water evaporation field. Uh, next please. Uh, this is an installation for a greenhouse in, in Hawaii where you see the water comes off the, the, the greenhouse, the vertical pipe, the, the big pipe going down in the corner, then comes out as you see over to the right into this uh, retention pond that's made from a depression in the ground wrapped in a pond liner. It is then pumped out as you see the bottom left through a shallow well pump and then the water is distributed up and you see the small piping running along the, the greenhouse again. It goes in to irrigate the flowers and such. And this is something that there's a similar process uh, that they use in a laundry that we saw in, uh, in, in Hawaii. Next please. This is a large scale operation. Uh, 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 hit the slide one more time please. That basically uh, is a situation where they live on an island, they were drinking wells, and after a while their well wasn't bothered by uh, saltwater uh, incursion. So uh, they went to rainwater catchment. Uh, this is of a scale that you'll see maybe a lot of uh, prisons, uh, 120,000 gallon storage. They use a combination of uh, bag filtration, chlorine, and ozone to get the water to rainwater to potable standards. Next please. And again, uh, Four reasons for using rainwater and gray waters. If you don't have enough water, you have poor water quality. Uh, I have a good friend who, uh, in, down in Atlanta who, because of the water quality there, prefers to make uh, brew his beer using rainwater rather than uh, the city water that, that's available there. Combined sewer flows, as we mentioned, is kind of the utilities issue. And then also you can use the stormwater runoff uh, if you capture it for taking up the cooling towers and, and uh, a lot of other constructive uses, rather than spending the money for a bigger pipe uh, to get rid of it. Uh, next, please. 
I said, my name is Bob Bulwer, and if you'd like to talk further about what the options are uh, in rainwater and gray water, uh, we'd be happy to entertain your call. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate it. Uh, I don't have any questions up on the uh, dashboard as I look at it right now, so real quickly, um, I'll, uh, I'll give you a chance. If you've got any questions for any of our presenters, go ahead and either raise your hand, uh, but preferably type them in. Um, and in the interim, um, do want to say thanks to, to Ed Howell of Icon, Peg Ritchie, and Bob Bulware um, for, for the time they took out to prepare these and um, uh, present them this morning. I think you'll agree that all three of these are very diverse. Uh, some of them have, have uh, penetrated the, uh, uh, the correctional environment pretty, um, I've got an open mic somewhere. Uh, both, but all three of them have have penetrated the corrections market market to one degree or another. Icon probably uh, more broadly than the others with a pure correctional application. Uh, but there's clearly a, uh, an advantage for um, uh, in some regions to take a look at waterless urinals, and certainly for those of you that have large, expensive uh, or expansive rather uh, agricultural and uh, applications. Uh, run uh, other kinds of uh, vehicle maintenance, those kinds of things, have large cooling towers. Uh, taking a look at, at rainwater might be something that you want to do. Um, finally, uh, again, would remind you of our uh, Symposium on Sustainability and Corrections in Indianapolis, October 29th through November the 1st. Uh, several of the folks present today will, will be presenting there, as will a number of others. We'll have over 35 workshops from practitioners from around the country. We'll have a number of vendors for you to, to uh, meet and talk to. Uh, but probably for me, the highlight of, of, the, um, of the, the symposium will be the opportunity to tour the, uh, the Pendleton Correctional Facility in Pendleton, Indiana on Thursday. Um, this is an older facility that uh, really disproves the uh, the notion that you have to be bright, shiny, new to be able to save on utilities. Um, for those of you who plan on attending that conference, I really encourage you to to allocate time uh, to to stick around on Thursday and tour the facility. Transportation and lunch will be provided to the institution. Um, and this is not your average institution tour. We're not there to, to look at fence lines and, and uh, uh, SEG units. We're there to look at sustainability applications, and there will be a number of very creative and innovative approaches at Pendleton, so I encourage you to, to join us in, in October and, and certainly to stay for the tour on Thursday. Uh, we're still looking for... Um, uh, we have an opening for a few presentations, and we also still have some room in the exhibit hall. So if you're a vendor uh, and are interested in getting in front of this audience, I would encourage you to uh, check out the uh, marketing materials on um, greenprisons.org. And if you have something that you'd like to share in your facility uh, and would like to uh, present at the, at the uh, symposium, we're still taking uh, workshop proposals. If yours is selected, your registration will be uh, comped for up to two presenters. Um, so that means it's, it's, uh, there's no registration fee to attend the symposium in, uh, in October in Indianapolis if you are a presenter. You might also take a look at hotel rates. We have some really, really good rates on hotels, free parking, free airport shuttle, and a variety of things uh, available to encourage your participation. Um, finally. Um, if you're going to be at Southern States, we hope you'll come by our booth next week. We'll be there Sunday and Monday during the open hours of the exhibit hall. And certainly if you're going to be at ACA and your travel plans allow you to, uh, we encourage you to come by the uh, Clean and Green Committee, which is the uh, uh, ACA's uh, sustainability committee and is the catalyst for all things uh, sustainable that, that – um, we've been talking about for the last year or so here on Green Prisons. Uh, we welcome your participation, uh, and if you would like to be a part of that committee in uh, during uh, President Chris Epps' term, which will begin in January, 
you want to make sure you let me know so that I can share that information with the folks at ACA and President-elect Epps. Um, with that in mind, um, we want to once again thank you for, for joining us today. As promised, we're going to get you at it, out at right at an hour. Um, I want to thank you for, uh, for joining us and watch the website. Keep an eye on your email for our next uh, webinar that will come up after ACA but before the conference. Thank you again to our presenters and thank you for joining us today for this look at effective water management in correction.